Hello everyone who's watching this on YouTube. Hello everyone who's listening to this on the Grapplers Radio Podcast. Today, I'm excited. We got the man, the myth, the man with a phone. Yeah, <laughs> UFC fighter, Alan Belcher. We gotta keep yeah. rolling through it. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna keep on going through this one. Uh, but, we, so we had a good little conversation a yeah. second ago, but yeah. we had to restart. Yeah. But let's just roll with it yeah. this time. Yeah, if, if, if you don't like if you don't like the podcast, I promise I'll give you all your money back. <laughs> Oh, so, man. you are looking pretty buff these days. What are you up to? Man, I, I really, uh, I'm just trying to stay in shape. And I found that the way that I, that I stay in shape the best, the way I feel best, is by lifting weights. And you know how you go through periods of time where you're mm-hmm. kind of interested in different things or whatever. So, like right now, I'm just, I'm interested in, in lifting and getting my body right. And I found that, dude, after years of jujitsu and MMA, and I was just kind of, you know, your body starts to, you know, um, fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a beating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It starts to fall apart. And, you know, um, I've, the weight lifting, I, I use kind of as like a, almost like a physical therapy type right. of thing, you know, to get my body back in the right order and line. And, and um, <clears throat> I've got these big old legs and a, a relatively smaller upper body compared to my huge legs, you know, so I think it helps me even out. i got to keep my core strong. You know, so just having fun with it, lifting weights and trying to trying to stay in shape. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you fought at 185 when you were uh-huh. in the UFC, right? Yeah. So what was your average walking around weight then? How much weight were you cutting before a fight? Um, I would say that um, I would my average weight would be about 220 pounds there, especially towards the more towards the end of my career. You were cutting from 220 down Two, to 185. I would be about 220 now. Um, couple things you got to take into consideration one thing is like i wasn't like a real lean type of person Mm -hmm. you know so like if i you took all my body fat away i would probably be closer to 205 or something or two but i so i would i would hold body fat and for some reason i'm just like real watery type of person now so i would i would kind of i could gain and lose really fast and as the years went on cutting weight and everything that became kind of a problem by that that severe dehydration, you know. People talk about how it gets harder and harder to cut that water weight. Yeah, it, it really does, and and um, <clears throat> I had like an effect where, um, from de- getting dehydrated and sucking all the water out, that after the fight, I don't know the hormones or whatever, it would bring back so much water. So then I would re- retain water really bad, you know. So I would get heavier and heavier and heavier, and you know the last couple fights, I was top of the of my weight class as far as rankings go you know so i was fighting the best guys trying to get the title shot i fought this being and okami and um, a few other guys that were ranked um, top you know like title contention type of things you know so um i really i wanted to stay in that weight class but i was really i probably should have been in a heavier heavier weight class you know so um, but then you would have been in the middle of that weight class or the lower end of that because the guys in the Next weight class up for walking around at yeah. 235. Yeah, yeah, probably probably so. You know, I think now um, people are getting away from or the culture is starting to change. Right. For, for so long, the culture has been that you have to cut weight. Right. Like everyone's big. If you're not cutting weight, you're going to go against these big giant monsters or whatever. Right. <clears throat> but really, I think the weight classes are, are appropriately – Spaced yeah, out. Yeah, spaced out. So um, I, I'm sure some would argue I'm, you could probably do a better job at it. But, I mean, they're pretty good spaced out. So, I mean, if you if you stay a little bit above just where you diet a little and, you know, maybe go in the sauna or something to get right down or whatever, and you're skilled, you're a skilled fighter, I think you have just, you know, it's not a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Well, take us through, like, an old school weight cut. Mm-hmm. Like, you're walking around what you look like, I don't know. 240-ish? Now I'd like 245, yeah. Okay, probably. so imagine a, an imaginary weight division of uh-huh. 215. Uh-huh. And you've got, you know, you you got a fight coming up at 215. Yeah. So you basically got to lose 30 pounds right. for fight night old school, and so you're allowed to rehydrate with IVs. Okay. What would you go through? What would the you next know, few weeks think, look like? I, mean, I think at this, what, there was probably, there's probably still a lot of 205ers that were, are probably about the, the size that I am. Now. Okay. okay so the, I would say. All right. So we won't go to an imaginary. You're going to yeah, cut that's, 205. That's a, long, that's a long ways. That's 40 pounds, right? Um, it's If you don't have the time to do it, then it's not, it's not going to work out. 
So how much time you know, would you need? Um, to properly without twenty pounds. All right. So here's I always tell people this when they're cutting weight. You have your your um, your goal weight is is going to be um, depending on weight what weight class you are. Obviously, when you're smaller, you're like a one twenty five er. You don't want to be cutting more than you know three or four pounds because you're so small of like water or right. whatever, right? But two hundred five, I would say um, ten pounds would be still pretty healthy. Ten pounds of water. Ten pounds of water. Yeah, because you're so big, you know. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the two hundred five ers were probably cutting more, like a, you know twenty pounds of water, mm. something like that. So they're coming in at two twenty five. So um, you could make it. If you're 225, you could make 205 easy. So I'm 245. I would have to come down to 225 first. Mostly with diet. That's or, that, or lack that's thereof. Diet. Yeah, that's <laughs> diet. You're going to lose some muscle because you're you're trying so hard to burn fat. Um, if you if you did it like a very slow way of like not losing muscle, you know, it could take a year. You know, if you did it very slowly. But usually, you know, a couple months, you do it very quickly. You end up losing some muscle mass. <clears throat> burning as much fat down as possible or whatever. Um, would you up your cardio? Like, would you actually get on the elliptical or the yeah? As far, as far yeah, as far as like burning it, yeah, you're just you're pretty much in like um, yeah fat burning mode. So you're you're starting to um, watch what you eat a little bit more. You know, more. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that you can you can diet or whatever. Um, it's tricky with with a sport like MMA because you're training all the time. Mm -hmm. So you can't, it's not like bodybuilding. You can't carb cycle really hard to where you like go low carb for two or three days. Like you won't be able to train, right? you know? So it's pretty tricky on that point. Um, but yeah, I figured out some tricks. Yeah. And cardio and everything's good. So yeah. And then for the last, the water cutting, you're just doing over the last couple of days. So you've, you've dieted down 20 pounds mm -hmm. say, and now you're, you're, uh, the last twenty, the last two days, you're just yeah. not drinking, not eating salt, and uh, jumping yeah. in the sauna a lot. Yeah, man. What we, what I learned, I, I, I did it with a couple different people, and, and um, um, the most common thing that, that works really good <clears throat> is to um, kind of shock your body. You know, it's like uh, what, what could I? It can, it kind of like dieting too kind of shock your body you know the idea of having like a cheat day and eating a lot of food mm -hmm. kind of tells your body to to help burn off more mm -hmm. and then so when you come back and you have lower calories lower carbs or whatever you burn fat more it's just kind of the same way with water so when you drink a lot of water your, your body gets better at excreting yeah, water your body wants to get rid of it yeah. so you, you you do the timing right that's why it's it's real important to be in that, that 24 48 hour period to have your body working really good you can't just stop drinking water for a week or something like yeah. people used to do back in the day they would you know oh, I'm just gonna drink kidney a failure <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly so you, you get you gotta have the timing down um, you drink lots of water maybe like two gallons of water for two days you know and salt all your food so your body has the sodium and the water intake and it's kind of, it's like oh it's, it's too much sodium too much water let's get this out of here and then you start scaling it you scaling it back until the point where you, you stop drinking water maybe like you know 24 hours before the the weigh in and then you'll just have a few sips here and there and then I remember trying to out. cut weight for a submission grappling tournament and I totally screwed it up because I was like just a know, five pounds over it's like okay that no problem I'll just not drink any water the night of and the next day and I've done this before and it's like I know I can lose four or five pounds by, uh -huh. by not drinking water but the night before, for my last meal, I went out for uh, Afghan food, which turns out super salty. Yeah. So it was delicious, but that salt was just in my system, and it was holding on every last water molecule, yeah. and I could not, for the life of me, lose that bloody water, and I ended up fighting you know, at the, the very, very bottom of the super heavyweight division. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah, man. Yeah, no, that'll do it. That'll do it. I had, um, I'm trying to think, what was the fight? I have a story kind of like that. Well, I fought a, a, a Canadian guy, Jason Day. Right. Yeah, and um, he uh, actually was one of the only people that um, I got. Well, I was finished two times, once by Jason Day and once by Kendall Grove. But um, he was a tough dude. I had a, um, I had a salmon, a uh, 
smoked salmon. Oh, just loaded it, with yeah. nitrites and so, and so sodium was, nitrite. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking, I was thinking, um, oh, can I get some salmon? You know, to just be like, let me just eat some protein or whatever. And they brought the smoked salmon. I didn't think of it at all, you know. So there's a lot of smoked salmon and some asparagus, you know. I was like, well, no, no, let me salt this. No salt or whatever, but it has the sodium right. in it, you know. So um, I had a really, really tough time cutting weight for that fight. So um, so when you say really tough time, give people, like, they don't know. Yeah, don't know, yeah. Like, what does that mean? Um, like, how many hours in the sauna? <laughs> how many hours are doing jumpy jacks in the sauna? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So probably... Um, probably six or seven hours of sauna work. Good God. Yeah, at least. At least we would, um, if the weigh-ins, sometimes we'd have to report to, uh, come down there to the weigh-ins at like two or three o'clock. And um, at, towards the end of my career, we were getting up at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. 6 a.m. to go get an early start because we had already known that in the past it had taken so long. I mean, because you can't just, you can't lose it quickly. You need time right. to sweat. Right. You know, so whew. you can either amputate your left foot or you can stay in the sauna. Oh man, yeah. There's some. Uh, there's been some, been some crazy times. This was uh, uh, a lot of mental toughness developed in the sauna. <laughs> a lot harder than the fight. You know, mm -hmm. the fight is is a short period of time compared to being a uh, sauna for six hours. The and when you were fighting, were IVs still legal after after the weigh-in? Um, I think, I'm not really sure if um, they were illegal or legal. It wasn't really something that we were really broadcasted or okay. anything. But like you saw that hadn't cracked down on it yet. And... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. There was no, no one was checking for it and saying you can't do it. I think my last couple of fights, they, they might have mentioned, there was no USADA with the UFC at the time. Mm -hmm. But there were, there were some talk about it, like, you can't use an IV, don't get caught, something like that, okay. but we're still doing it. Right. You know, um, it's funny, like they're like, so how the hell can they test for IVs, but they're checking for the, the plasticizers, yeah. the, the stuff in the plastic of the, the actual bottle that leaks out into the water in like parts per billion or parts per trillion. That's amazing. It's crazy. That's, yeah, that's it makes amazing. you wonder why they're not using like glass bottles and, you know, I don't know, like a pig vein or something. I'm sure yeah. somebody's out there trying to figure out how to game the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's got to be a way to do it. I mean, and that, but IV, and I mean, even if you're cutting a little, you know, five pounds or something, that IV has to help. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's kind of like one of those things where you'd have to do a study. You have to do mm -hmm. several study with hundreds of people to actually prove it. But I mean, I just know from experience, I've rehydrated. You know, you just can't drink enough fast enough to yeah, get the liquid get, in your system. Yeah, yeah, you just, I mean, it's just right into your blood, your blood into your muscles, and, and uh, yeah, the IV helps. If I did it, if I fought now, there's no way that I, I would do 185, I could be able to do at 185. No okay. way, not without an IV. Okay. It'd be hard with an IV now that I'm so, I've gained so much weight, yeah. you know, but um, yeah. Good weight. Yeah. Good weight, muscle yeah. weight, but, so, but yeah. still, that's be a lot to... Well, until you, you said you go through phases, so maybe next year you'll be the, the ultra marathoner, yeah. uh, Alan Belcher, <laughs> doing like adventure racing in Costa Rica. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, nothing I like know. a tapeworm to help you cut 30 pounds. Hey, man, yeah. You never know. You never know. But uh, I'll come back on and we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, the super skinny version. So, not to dwell too much on the whole UFC thing, but what's the process of a training camp like like again so let's say you were fighting at 205 yeah two months from now right, right? it's a big weight cut but it's not impossible you've been training but you're not training like a fighter like you're not so hypothetically what would your two months training camp look like what would what would you'd leave yeah. this interview and you would do what um uh, two months out from the fight i think at that time you you got to be going pretty hard yeah, you got to be going pretty hard to, um, two months out, meaning um, twice a day, twice a day on most days. What? Um, excuse me. Um, yeah, twice a day on most days. And, and what we did like, with uh, with two a day training was we would never do anything that was real um, had like a heavy load to it, like as far as um, explosive type of sprinting, and then 
the second workout would be like heavy lifting or like wrestling, you know, and then the other workout would be like sparring. It would always be more of a technical session. Yeah, complement mm -hmm. each other. You want to get two in, so you're maximizing maximizing your time, but at the same time, you want to keep your body, you know, fresh enough to go make it into the next next day. So I would say two months out, um, you're going pretty hard. You want to if you you're working on your strength, that's the time to do it. You know, because you don't want to be doing real heavy, you know, strength training, trying to make gains when you get too close to the fight. It's going to take you a week to get back to baseline. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, last two or three weeks, rolling into the last two or three weeks, you really want to be, you know, taking it easy, starting to recover, starting to freshen up your body. Um, I think people uh, tend to cram in, you know, as they get closer and they're trying to work harder and harder as they get closer to the fight. And it's really important to one stay in shape all year round, mm -hmm. and then when you get it, you get a date for your competition. It could be for jujitsu or whatever. You block out the time to where you have your heavy training, you know, um, one, two, three months out if you can plan that far out, right. and then you start to taper off. And you you you, you want to keep things like your um, your intensity level for say like 60 seconds or, or you know what I mean maybe you're doing a five minute round or a 10 minute round in jiu-jitsu if you work up to um to a certain intensity or endurance or whatever you want to maintain that you just want to take away the volume of work you know what I mean so as you're getting more <clears throat> intense you're doing less total work yeah otherwise exactly. you'll fry your yeah, exactly. Your endocrine system and yes, your body and everything. Exactly. So the way you, you get your endurance and your strength and, and your reps and all that up is like you're raising the volume and the intensity. Once you get the intensity and um, your your level of energy, wherever you want it, right, you want to keep that, but you start to taper off the volume right. of work. So your practices get shorter, you know. Um, like Did you ever compete like severely? <clears throat> what we're talking about here is preventing overtraining, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Did you ever compete super overtrained? Um, or were you pretty good about this? I was pretty good about it. The problem with me when I was when I was training, and I would, you know, people should avoid this is is um, the the weight cutting really. And we were talking about weight cutting a lot. But that was really the problem for me. Is the, there was there was so much dieting and cardio that had to be done to get my body to the right scale weight. That I wasn't able to properly train mm. for the for the competition. You know, but you can't. There's so many aspects of it. How are oh, you yeah. going to do all of them perfect? No, yeah, yeah you, you can't. It, it is what it is. But I mean, if anything, um, that was the, you know, that was the case for me. You right. know, it was that that, that you, you got to make weight, right? So mm -hmm. you got you got to do it. So um, that would that would be the overtraining for me. So I was I was pretty good. And um, everything was very scientific and laid out and well thought out. Every fight, I was getting better and better at running the camp. It's just when when it came down to it, down to the wire, the last three or four weeks, you have to adjust your diet. You have to step up the cardio. And a lot of times you lose a lot of what you worked for, you know, what you're working for all year round. Your body just kind of, you know, drags down. But that, that's part of it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that being said... Um, I had some really great fights, um, yeah. tr you know, overtrained still where you just take the mindset in there. You know, a lot of times it's, um, people dwell on the body and we're talking about cutting weight and strength training and all that, but the mind is really, really where it's at, you know? Well, you have so many great fights, but I just want to pick your brain about one of them. It's the fighting you had against Paul Harris. Okay. So, I mean, for being most people know who Paul Harris is, but I mean, a giant freakazoid. Yeah, a lot of people call him a dirty fighter. Sure, yeah. uh, known for like you know getting heel hooks and not letting them go. After you know, like you get caught in something by him, you tap, and then he tears. Man, did you see Jake Shield? Or he took Jake Shields. Yes, the yes, 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 behind yeah. his back yeah. and hit. Oh man! Yeah, it was a non leg lock submission. So you're going in to fight this guy. What was like? You're like hell yeah, I'll fight him. Or like, were you were you worried? Now now that that's over, were you yeah. worried at all about your knees? <laughs> Um, I was worried. This is where I was. My, um, it's very interesting, the mindset behind that. At that point in my career, <clears throat> I wanted, I, I would felt myself, my heart kind of pulling away from fighting and mm -hmm. I wasn't really motivated 
to like chase the title and you know that type mm-hmm. of thing. So um, I knew that I I had to have a challenge. Like I I needed to go against someone who, was, who could beat me, basically. That's so interesting. Yeah, and that's what I needed. So it's really weird, but um, something know, to I get just, your full yeah, attention. I just fought, you know I've been fighting pretty much my whole life, and <clears throat> I just know kind of what gets me going, what doesn't, and. Um, my fights where I thought I was going to win. No disrespect to Jason Day. That guy was a very tough fighter. Uh, but I thought, not like his actual skill level and who you know who's better or whatever, put that aside. But in my mind, I thought I could beat him. Sure. And I didn't perform very well. Sure. You know, that's that's kind of the point I'm making. It wasn't your day. You, when you go against the big guy at the bar that's like seven foot tall, you know, like you have to perform. Right. You have, I mean, you got to be, and your body knows that. Like, you, you, you have like a fear, right? Yeah. And um, your, your, just your nervous system and everything works better, and you're, you're, you're motivated by that, you know, fight or flight mm-hmm. type of thing that we have naturally. So when you're going against somebody that has a, you know, like they're, they're aggressive, they're mean, you know, it's kind of scary to go against somebody that's like they don't care to break your leg, yeah. and their skill is better. They got the leg locks and everything, so. To me, the, I, I heard about that fight offer. I was like, oh, that that's, as far as the rankings, that didn't really matter to me. It just really, I knew I was going to train. I was going to train for it and go, you know. How did you train for it? Who did you bring um, in to, to simulate that kind of an animal? Um, I was, my coach at that time was uh, Daniel Marias, and I was working with him for a few years during that period right there. And um, um, Daniel, I brought Daniel in. And he's just like a really, just got a really solid grappling game. And and I saw that guy go against people with good leg locks, good sweeps. And he always just, he just has this real basic top game that just is just crushing. So I, I knew that he would be the right guy to kind of lead me into that very, um, it ended up being kind of a wild fight, you know. But in mm-hmm. my head, I was like, this has to be one of those very careful things where I control the hips and stay away. So he was kind of the lead there. And um, we uh, we called up Dean Lister and Dottie Hamos, which were two um, uh, leg lock guys coming on onto the scene and uh, like that were really doing leg locks at that time. And this is before this whole leg lock, yeah. you know, um, craze that we're kind of going through now. You know, and they've been going through the last couple of years, the submission only. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, Davi and Dean. <clears throat> were uh, getting leg locks in high level competitions. Yeah, they're right long time leg lockers. Yeah, this is right at, yeah, oh yeah, they go way back. And um, Dean had just, I think he just heel hooked Rudolfo in Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. He kind of, he was out for a couple of years, like, where's Dean Lister? And then all of a sudden, boom, Abu Dhabi, he won it. And, you know, so um, I think it was right after that, I'm pretty sure. So um, we got Dean to come in and Dobby. Both were there for about three or four weeks, I think, almost a full month, um, rolling with those guys every day, drilling. They were, they would catch me, and you know, we'd start all the way in heel hooks and, you know, straight in clock, toe hold, work out of it, start in the position, work out of it, start in kind of, you know, semi, you know, loose position. an entanglement, but yeah, not fully on. Exactly. So we just did a lot of specific drilling, and then um, when you go with those guys, when you roll with them, that's, they're pretty much going for leg locks the whole time. So. Right. Um, all my reactions and stuff were were pretty much on point. So I kind it made of for a super exciting fight because it, it really especially did. if you got it a little bit in on the leg yeah. lock and you fought your way out. And you yeah, and you know what? A lot of people um, they always say about that fight is like you went for you went in there like to the legs and like you didn't get away from it or whatever. Like you went into his world, and that wasn't really the plan. I think it was one of those things where you train for it so much, you see mm. it in your head so much. I was just magnetized into that oh, leg, no. you know, which is kind of a bad thing, but it made for a yeah. made for an exciting fight. But it wasn't like it was the plan. Well, MMA just, fans, thank you for for playing that. Yeah, I suppose it's like we could go out on the ocean where it's nice and calm, or we go to that part where there's that giant rip curl happening. You know, yeah. we're, we'll go out to Jaws and we'll surf there. Yeah, you know, one makes for better television than you know me floating on a surfboard. Out in the middle of the ocean is boring. Yeah. Uh, me getting absolutely thrashed potentially in, in Jaws <laughs> makes for exciting television. Exactly. So. Oh, yeah. It was, a, it was an exciting fight, you know. He shot. Uh, the, the game plan was to keep distance, you know, and stop his takedowns. 
I knew he would do, he would like clinch and pull guard underneath, you know, that type of thing. So I was going to stay out of the clinch, stay out of the takedown. And he shot that single leg on me with his head outside. And I had been working on uh, the truck twister type of positions mm -hmm. and stuff. So I went for that. And um, I was like, I'll be damned. I'm about to tap this guy with the, with a twister and I was working on the, the, the arm and everything and uh, he kind of scrambled free and that's when he got on my leg mm -hmm. so the next little bit was just kind of defending those until he got a little bit tired and I got some some punches in and went into his guard and finished him it was a fun fight it was cool well there's that classic uh, I think it's Carlson Gracie quote of like you take a black belt and you punch him once in the head he becomes a brown belt yeah punch him twice in the head he becomes a purple belt yeah <laughs> punch yeah. him three times he becomes a blue belt so exactly and, Exactly. Sort of, kind of what yeah, you did. Well, that's the, yeah, that's the fun part about MMA. You know, it's mixing it, mixing it up, and, and learning how to really use jujitsu. You know, and I'm sure you're interested in that too, as you know, fellow jujitsu lover. That's really what it's about. You know, is is, is trying to use it in a, in a simulated street scenario, yeah. right? You know, about as close as you get to a real fight, right? Yeah, and I mean, I know you do a lot of striking and tie boxing. You're after we finish here, you're about to run off, do some tie boxing training. Uh -huh. But uh, it's it's inherently safer than, you know, getting punched in the face repeatedly, but it's got it's still very, very applicable in real life. So that's oh, yeah. kind of, it's kinda of cool that way. I mean yeah, you're not yeah. potent, you know, you're not risking the whole uh, C T E concussion thing. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. It's Are you worried were you worried about that at all at the time? Like getting as uh, fighting in MMA and doing the Muay Thai stuff and like the, the brain trauma? Um, mm, I think, you know, towards the end, towards the end, I was, I was a little bit concerned with it, you know, it's because I started thinking back, like, yeah, I've taken a lot of, a lot of hits and, and, uh, there was some, some slow memory moments for me yeah. and attention type Se of things. Seniors moments. Exactly. My, my wife even said, you got to go to the doctor. We're going and getting you checked out and this. I mean, it just turned out to be like a severe, ADD type of thing, you know, they said, oh, you're, you're fine. You just, you just have bad ADHD, you right. know? So I'm like, okay, cool. And that was, that was pretty much the end of, that was near my last fight or whatever. So I checked out. And that was another thing that kind of made it okay for me to go. I was like, my brain's cool. You know, mm -hmm. um, I can still see, I had the eye surgeries, you know, it kept me out for a couple of years. And, um, that last fight with Bisping, I got poked in the eye, got, cut my eyelid but it was the same uh, eye that I had multiple surgeries on but you know I pretty good decent vision a little bit blurry lost a little bit of um, peripheral peripheral and uh, you know but I can still see you know thank God my brain's good and no like severe back or neck trauma or whatever so I'm like let's well, just move on and do something else run the businesses and you know so now you're running I was it we're talking last night, I think, three schools right now? Yeah, we have three. We have three gyms down in uh, South Mississippi, Gulf Coast area, you know, and that's, that's doing really good. Introduced a lot of people to kickboxing, a lot of kids. We have a huge kids program and um, jiu-jitsu, you know, in my in my area. You know, I've been down there where I live for about 12 years, you know, and I was like one of the first people do jiu-jitsu and MMA and that, you know, so. What's the split yeah. on, like, kickboxing versus jiu-jitsu? People come in through the door and they want to do what? Uh, most of our clients are ki are um, fitness kickboxing. Okay. And then next would be parents getting their kids in, in, in martial arts. Jiu-jitsu program, we have good, we have a good jiu-jitsu program. It's just we, we do so much fitness kickboxing because, right. you know, I love, um, it, it's a good business move, but it's also good fitness kickboxing is... Um, a good way to a gateway expose. Drug. It really is. It really is. You know, and, and um, we do the same thing with the with the kids. I kind of learned that um, you know doing kids jujitsu. Um, that's really what I want the kids to do. But sometimes when you get the kids, you throw them in there and they start grappling and doing stuff on the ground. Some get it, and some don't. Some are really they love it right off the bat. Some kind of don't. You know, martial arts uh, where they do more like a blended, you know, punching and kicking, kind of the same thing with adults doing kickboxing. They're able to get past that first couple of months of training and start to like it and then say, okay, now I'm, I want to do, maybe I want to do jiu-jitsu. They've already like done that. the super scary thing of coming into a school in the first place. Yeah. 
they, they don't know who you are. Yep. They don't know that you're not going to you know, tear their heart out with yeah. your spear hand technique. Exactly. And then maybe they could scare themselves again by, yeah. you know, doing this man hugging stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the system that we're, what we're working on is to, um, one for business and to also just expose more people to, to jujitsu mm-hmm. and stuff. Cause I, that's really what I, I want other people to share that love for, for jujitsu. I love Muay Thai too. I'm really, I'm focused on, I'm focused on Muay Thai right now just because to be honest with you, I haven't really, um, I haven't really practiced that much in the last four year, three or four years. Right. So I'm trying, I'm getting, I was like, man, I spent my whole life, you know, doing Muay Thai and getting good at that. I don't want to, I haven't really done it in four years. Mm-hmm. So right now I'm practicing, just trying to get my skills up to par, you know, okay. to kind of where they were, you know, it'd be kind of like, um, cause what, there wasn't much reason to do it. Jiu Jitsu, I'm drawn to, it. it's easy to go get on the mat, no gi, you know, all, at least twice a week, right. you know, once or twice a week um, training. So, but Muay Thai, there was really no reason to do it. But I wanted to get my skills, so I'm kind of working on that now. Okay. Yeah. What did you start with originally? What was your first martial art? Uh, my first martial arts was Tang Sudo when I was eight years old. Okay. Yeah. So you got and your black belt at ten. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Six months later, black belt. Um, Thank God for your parents signing yeah. you up for the black belt program. <laughs> I know. I know, man. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, so I did Tang Sudo and then, uh, Taekwondo. They actually, Tang Sudo was pretty legitimate. That guy was, um, responsible. His name was Randy O'Neill. And he, okay. He, yeah. I, okay. All the hate mail. I, I get hate mail all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that guy, the Tang Sudo guy would actually expose me to Gracie Jiu Jitsu okay. and, um, you know, some other people that were doing more of a mixed type of thing back then, you know, so, um. Wasn't that was that Chuck Norris's first style tank sudo? I think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. of course Chuck Norris got the association with Machados. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I later did Taekwondo. Not really. Basically because there wasn't much else to do. Mm-hmm. You know, tank sudo guy kind of flaked and went away or whatever. So I just continued on with with Taekwondo and you know they give you the belts easy and stuff. They let me basically just pick up exactly where I was in tank sudo. They're like. Oh, <laughs> we keep the same belt, you know, so I was a black belt in Taekwondo before long, and then um, I started doing uh, jiu-jitsu and grappling Muay Thai with, with one guy when I was about 14, okay. you know, and then uh, shoot, six months six months later, I had my first um, Muay Thai kickboxing fight. How many uh, kickboxing uh, fights did you do? Um, I probably had about nine or ten, something like that. I never lost, and... You know, amateur, you know, sure. amateur kickboxing, but I think I think I had about ten, at least, yeah, at least nine or ten, something like that. And I had also had an MMA fight when I was fourteen years old. Really? So I was um, one of the one of the first. Um, I'm thirty two now, but you know, I was one of the first like kids, you know, that was like actually training um, mm-hmm. MMA and jujitsu, and and I had that fight when I was fourteen against an adult. And I won. I was about. I was probably 165, 170 pounds. Big 14 was, year old. I was 14. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I won against a guy. He was probably maybe 25, something like that. I got an Americana. Well, good for you. Yeah. yeah. Some some friends of mine who've, who've done all three are they're saying, look, if you want to do MMA, that's great. But before you go do MMA, you should go get a you know. A little bit of amateur boxing, uh-huh. a few amateur boxing fights in, or amateur kickboxing. You should also go do a whole bunch of submission grappling tournaments. And right. only after you've got that exposure to, you know, the, uh, you know, the less, you know, the smaller aspects of the, the combative arts, and yeah. gotten that experience performing in front of crowds, then you should go to MMA. Do you agree with that? Or I think so. Yeah, that's what I did. Not by, wasn't not by plan design. or anything. Yeah, yeah but um, the, yeah, I think it, it worked out pretty good. And that's that, I would. I would recommend at least grappling for sure. At least do jujitsu tournaments. That is, I've saw people, you know, and you saw too, have four matches in just from the match one to match four. They're a completely different athlete. Yeah. Mentally, yeah. you know what I mean. So they they just learn how to compete in one day. It's it's amazing what how the com- competition will do that to you. Your mind, your confidence, and just your ability to just. It's obviously not as good as 300 matches. No, yeah. But you get the biggest effect right off the 
beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially when you're first, especially when you're first starting. Yeah, so you don't want to jump in MMA. You want to at least at least do a few um, grappling tournaments where you're not getting punched. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where the consequences of totally screwing up are slightly less. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Uh, now, so then you you did your jujitsu. Uh, you got your black belt. Uh-huh. That yeah. was under Helios Center. Helios Center, right? Yeah. Yeah, he gave me. But you've trained with some other, or with some other big names too. Right? Um, yeah, yeah, I have. Um, Seneca, uh, Sene- I got my blue, purple, brown, and black from Seneca. I was very loyal to him, and um, you know, he mentored me through my, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu journey there. Um, but I, yeah, I also had a really close relationship with Daniel Marias. Mm-hmm. Um, so l- later on. Um, in my career, we, we met, met up, and he was living in Florida, and I'm in Mississippi. It's not too far away, you know, so he had come over, taught some seminars, and um, ended up working together, and uh, so he spent a lot of time there, and I went to Brazil with uh, Daniel and Diego Marias several times. You know, Where were you training in Brazil? Uh, in Rio, at the, yeah, a couple different, they're, they're Gracie, Gracie Academy, Gracie Affiliates, you know, so um, he's a hoiler, Daniel's a hoiler black belt um but yeah what was the brazil experience like for you um i liked it yeah it was cool it was cool training in brazil and it it was um i did probably one trip i did was more like vacation and one was pretty serious actually i I had my eye injury in brazil oh really yeah it was so what happened there i just woke up and couldn't see that's it nothing nothing. that was it detached retina detached retina yeah so scary when you start to go to a um, a tear or something on your retina, I guess it's it's basically a lot of people think they hear retina and they think it's like the the lens or something on your your eye, but it's re- it's actually something on that back up inside of your eye that helps transmit the light and everything's kind of like a computer chip or something, you know, it's kind of floating in there on the back, and it, it, you get a tear on it, <clears throat> and the, the the fluid inside your eye starts to go back there and eventually it pushes it off and then you just blind basically so um, I guess the warning signs were like flashes of lights some spots or something I, I saw some stuff like that but I didn't really think much of it one day we were in Brazil training I was gonna fight uh, Damian Maya Damian Maya and me both had a po- poster you know poster fight top contender type of fight mm-hmm. you know so it was a really big deal I was training hard awesome shape I was, I was um, in my peak, I thought I was, you know, uh, of course, yeah. of course you were in the best shape of your life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect timing. Perfect timing. So I woke up and I just couldn't, couldn't see. I'm like, dude, I'm blind. Like what is the, it was terrifying really. No, no doubt. I was, I was out of the country too. So they took me, we went to a doctor, some back alley in, yeah. <laughs> in Rio. With... Yeah. Went to a couple of doctors and they're, you know, speaking Portuguese, kind of like, Oh, the energy wasn't good. I'm like, that doesn't sound good. So no. like, you need to fly home immediately and get surgery on this. So got a ticket. I was I was home within 24 hours mm-hmm. from the doctor. We basically went to the airport, you know, and, and one day later I was at the doctor and um, they did like an emergency surgery. Um, he looked at it, got me right in. Was that with a laser or was it too far gone for like um, laser type stuff? Yeah, no, it was a, there's two different surgeries they do on this. And, and one of them is less work to recover from or whatever. So he tried that first and it ended up failing a few months later and I had to do it again. So oh, Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. So um, basically what they do is, is um, he... Uh, Somehow or another, they poke a hole in your eye and get that retina back on the back. And then they take a, a plastic, almost like one of those zip ties, and wrap it around your eye and zip oh it down God. and turn your eye into like a football. And so uh, this is still on my eye. No and way, they, really? Yeah, so they, they pull everything back and oh. your eye's kind of sticking out. And they squeeze it down. I think I have is, a fairly strong stomach, but that's that's gross, man. Yeah. So your 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 eyes like a circle, and they turn it into like a root. This, yeah, yeah. you know, and it, I guess the pinching down of your eye kind of holds that on the back. Okay. You know, so you got to be real still, 
And, oh, you're uh, conscious while they're doing this? Uh, no. No, okay. Oh, yeah. oh All God, right. no. <laughs> I thought you had um, to be still during the surgery. Yeah, you have to be really still in recovery. Oh, okay. You can't get hit or anything. You have to right. be real careful and, um, you know, otherwise it comes off or whatever. So, anyways, it, the healing process started taking place and um, I started seeing spots and then, boom, blind again about uh, six weeks later. So then they had to do the other surgery, which is where they put a gas bubble. This one is so terrible. They, they inject um, oil into your eye, and um, they put a bubble, an air bubble, into in your eyeball. And so now that air bubble floats up, you know. And uh, so you have to lay face down on a massage table. For six weeks, basically. No way. Really. Yeah, yeah. So eight, uh, you sleep eight hours, and then you're supposed to be eight hours while you're awake on the massage table. So the bubble holds the retina up against exactly, the top of the eye. Exactly. Exactly. So that was that was really a miserable, depressing you know, time for me. Oh no! <laughs> talking about living hell for an ADHD. Uh, oh, you know, for us oh people who need like ping, ping, ping. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Could you just take this bucket of squirrels? <laughs> and let it run underneath the table. At least that's something to look yeah, at. Yeah, something, man. Something. Oh, man. I was at, uh, actually... There How were, did you spend the time? I got into reading, actually. Really? You know, there wasn't much else to do. It was kind of hard with one eye, you know. Um, but uh, I did get into reading and um, discovered audio. Mm. Audio books, too. That type of thing. Um, one of my mentors... I'm looking for like a permanent indent ring on your face from where there's like the massage oh, table. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's been a lot, a lot of time. So you were sleeping face down as well? Um, yeah, you're supposed to sleep face down too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So 16 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah, it sucked. It sucked. It was terrible. Um, Did you fight after? So then the, the retina scars to the back of the eye there, presumably. Yep. Yeah, that's, and then uh, yeah, I did fight. I um, after that, mm -hmm, yeah, I made a, a comeback, and I was out for a little less than a year, which felt like so long yeah. at that time. Now looking back at my, my fight in 2013, it really doesn't seem that long ago. Um, but during that time, I felt like I was out forever. It was less than a year, and um, I was contemplating calling it quits then. Yeah. And um, I guess enough time went by, and I was like, you know what? Let's just do this, mm -hmm. do it again. So um, the, uh, the initial retina tear was almost certainly from <clears throat> getting punched. I in think the face. so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's from yeah. Impact. Yeah, exactly. You don't really get that unless you're old. Yeah. You know, like in your seventies, eighties, nineties, something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're younger and you have it, it's usually from some type of trauma, car accident, or getting hit in the head, or something, or right. in the eye. Um, but yeah, I, I, I had to come back, fight Jason McDonald, another Canadian. Yeah. Um, not an easy fight either. No, not, yeah, not an easy fight at all. Um, but there wasn't really, there wasn't any really easy fights or whatever. So, um, so, uh, I fought him in New Orleans, which is, was close to where I live. Probably I live an hour away from mm -hmm. New Orleans. So all my friends and family and stuff came. It was kind of like a local, local type of thing. So it was a really cool experience. Um, I ended up, I think I won first round, first round TKO and, um, on that fight and then had a good little roll. That's when I fought, um, Govea, TKO'd him, um, Paul Yaris, and I think there was one more or something. I had, I had four in a row, something mm -hmm. like that. So I had a nice little streak coming back, you know. So maybe that year layoff, <laughs> yeah. literally a layoff. Yeah, uh, was what you needed. Yeah, it helped. It helped out, you know. So um, it's funny how like the, it must seem completely terrible at the time, and then in retrospect, it all worked out, and it maybe even helped you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how the uh, God or universe or whatever you want to call it works. Sometimes things just kind of things line up for you at the right times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, just let's finish on the, on this then. For people out there who are listening to this but don't train or maybe they train uh, kickboxing but they want to start jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for people just getting started in martial art training? Like that, that is, there are a lot of people out there who are thinking about starting or maybe yeah. they did it as a kid and they want to come yeah. back. Like, 
what, what advice would you give them? What general advice do you give to people who ask you about this? Um, I would say that there's so many different things that you can that you can do. It, you know, you can use MMA as a workout. You can do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with a gi or no gi or Muay Thai. I would say, um, you know, have fun and, and try a little bit of everything. Kind of see what see what you see what you like and and um, give it a chance and and because uh, when you develop a, a passion for it and a love for it, it's really uh, our community. You know, MMA and Jiu Jitsu community is just. It's awesome, you know, yeah. like the people, no matter where you go, you have that connection or whatever. So it's a really cool, you know, family to be in. So um, I, I, I just give people, I just tell people to just try it out. Try a couple different things out, you know, try to see if you develop that love for it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess once you get the love for it, well, once you get the love for it, yes. training doesn't become a chore. Yeah, it exactly. It becomes something yeah. to look forward to. Yeah, and, and it, you know, there's no, people don't like to have to lift weights and get on the treadmill or you know go running and those types of things it's boring you know so if you're if your workout can be like your hobby too you know you're not really thinking about how hard it is or whatever so it's a, it's a good thing to to uh, keep you in shape okay so if people live in the Gulf Coast area just what's the name of your school oh Alan Belcher MMA okay so Alan if you Belcher do a search if you use the Google thing and yeah, yeah, you can find it on Google. Yeah. Yeah, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing your job. Yeah. yeah. And then you also you also do coach some other people on how to run their own schools, right? Yeah, yeah. I have the yeah consulting company, combatbusinesssuccess.com. Um, so I work with work with gym owners, you mm -hmm. know, now that, that, you know, that I've transformed into more of an entrepreneur, you know, that after finishing my career, um, I wanted to continue – to work in the space right. of martial arts and stuff. You know, I could do tons of things for money, but I would rather contract you know, killing. And yeah, kind of exactly. yeah. There's a body, pro bodybuilding. Yeah there's, yeah. there's jobs for MMA fighters. Yeah. Bodyguard, you know, things like that. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I learned a few things about business and, um, and I feel that like helping, helping people with their business is, it helps people create an income from martial arts, but it also the um, think the way that you're making the way that you're making money is really by selling more martial arts, which is expanding mm -hmm. how many people are doing it. You know, so yeah. it's a way to instead of just have my gym and sign up local people or whatever, I help other people around the world now because I have clients in a lot of different countries and um, <clears throat> help them enroll more students in their in their schools which spreads jiu-jitsu most of my clients do are jiu-jitsu you know mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu kickboxing muay thai mma stuff like that awesome yeah. well good luck with your school and good yeah. luck with your all your other endeavors man it's uh, yeah. it's been really fun to talk to you all right i appreciate it thank you